Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for this and uh, our latest event with the UC Master Gardeners. We're fortunate today to have uh, Louise Christie and Vera Kark, uh, both of whom are very uh, well informed in their areas. Uh, Vera is going to be our main speaker today while Louise will be keeping an eye on the chat for any questions and also uh, helping with distributing the handout. So there will be time at the end for questions. However, if you think of something while the presentation is going on, please feel free to post it in the chat. Uh, we'll try and get to it at the end. And if there's anything we don't get to, we will of course provide the Master Gardener's link so you can always contact them afterwards. With that, um, Vera, if you'd like to take over. Here. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. A Little bit about Master Gardeners. We exist here to help you be successful in your gardening. And our website is kind of starting point for all, all good information. And that's our website. All of that, all of the links that you're going to see in this talk are in the handout. So you don't know, need to necessarily write them all down. On our website, you can access the help desk uh, where you can ask your questions. You can either phone them in or send them by email. And we do have the presentations online on our YouTube website. And we also sign up for our monthly tips and events newsletter. We send out just one email a month and it's very handy. I even enjoy learning a lot of things from it. So um, that's the starting, that's who we are. And today we're going to talk about sustainability in, in landscaping. And one thing to keep in mind, this is an overview talk. There, it's a huge topic and there's a lot of different information about it. Uh, but this gives you an overview of the basic concepts and then um, with links into and to more resources that can give you further information. So one of the things in, in thinking about this talk, nature already knows how to be sustainable and has been sustainable for, for the life of the earth, so to speak. Uh, modern humans are, we're still learning because we've, we've, taken advantage of a lot of these resources. We've made cement, we've built houses, we live in neighborhoods. And now we need to figure out how do we maintain that while still keeping our resources and keeping the environment in, a, in balance. So sustainable is a big word. What is sustainable landscaping? Uh, it's a group of practices that when, when done together, they preserve our local ecosystems, they prevent air, water, and soil pollution. They reduce costs and maintenance, and they optimize our resources. And we do this by using a variety of strategies that create, uh, that are environmentally friendly and are climate appropriate. And you'll learn that that's a, the climate is a really big part of this. It benefits nature, and ultimately it benefits us. And the ways it benefits, we conserve water by using sustainable practices. We can improve our soil health. We can reduce our organic waste, uh, reduce the amount of maintenance we need to do on our yard. Uh, it does improve the air quality. We can create a habitat through appropriate plant selection. In other words, we're sharing with a bigger, bigger group of critters besides ourselves. And also ultimately it can create and help guide and create us a space that is both beautiful and provides sanctuary, which is something we all need. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, sustainable, that's a really big word, you know, continual, continuous, you can see the whole list of other uh, similar words, but ultimately it's about common sense, taking care of what you have and making it better. Don't waste or damage the resources, use plants that like our climate, and nurture a place in nature that brings you joy, work with it. And ultimately keep in mind that small changes will make a difference. So take it step by step. And one of the first steps you're doing is right here, learning more about it and learning the vocabulary and learning the concepts. Um, in spite of all that, Many, many, many organizations uh, do believe this is a really great idea, sustainability. And there is a lot of support to teach and help you uh, know more about it, to implement it in your own garden. And we'll go through some of those, but top off the list, you know, UC Davis, they have a 
Toolkit, University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. So these are all different websites and organizations that have created uh, suggestions and guidelines on how to be create a sustainable landscape. And to give you some ideas, the, ho the house on the left is my house when I bought it. And as you can see, if you had a crayon, you could draw a little house and a green yard, and there's a tree over there, and that's what it would have looked like. So that's our kind of classic concept of what a landscape can be. It's kind of boring. And two years later, I actually had a landscaper help me design and implement a, uh, a water-wise landscape. And one of the things, just right off the bat, you can see, if you see, the, originally there was a cement walkway right to the front of the house. That was removed, and a walkway of pavers was put in. Now, and as you'll hear later, the pavers are not cemented in, and when it rains, the rainwater drains into the ground. It doesn't drain down the walkway and into the street. So that's just one little thing that, that can make a difference. Now, the other thing is to keep in mind, nature is not static. So by September of 2016, my, some of the plants had really grown. I'd taken some out and put different ones in, uh, and, and things had changed over time. And then July of this year, you can see, I actually cut down or pruned down a fair amount in the front because it was getting a little bit over, overgrown. So it's, it's an ongoing process. In general, although you can create landscapes that, that stay similarly the same, overall, I enjoy the fact that it evolves, that it changes, that things grow, that I might want to put something different in. So one of the, we're, I'm gonna go through the, some of the different resources just to uh, clue you in. Uh, one great one is the UC Arboretum. And it's a great place to visit once things open up. And they have all kinds of resources there, plant lists, uh, uh, all kinds of guidelines to, uh, to improve and give you suggestions how to create a sustainable landscape. The California Garden Web, also from the University of California, Agriculture and Natural Resources, a awesome resource for not only sustainable gardening, but all the components that go into it. And uh, there you'll find all kinds of resources. And again, keep in mind, all of these links, all of these are going to be listed in the handout. Even the Santa Clara County government wants you to be sustainable because when you practice sustainable gardening in our county, it helps everybody. It helps them uh, manage the resources better and creates environments that, that benefit all components, not only humans, but, but the, the enterprises and how they all work together. Another or group of organizations that really care about sustainable gardening are the water districts. And the San Jose Water District also has an excellent set of resources on sustainable gardening. And as you can see, sustainable landscaping fundamentals and plant, plant lists and landscaping ideas. So one of the key components is if you practice sustainable gardening, one of the, one of the cornerstones of that is saving water. San Jose Water District wants you to save water. So that's how they want you to be, that's how they, it helps you support their needs. Another water district, the East Bay Municipal Utility District, they have a great list of plans and a, and a good book that's, that's referenced from the website that also gives you plant lists for plants that do well in the shade, plants that do well in the sun, uh, tall plants, short plants, trees. So all of these can give you different kinds of information. They all might come at it different ways, but between all of them, you're going to get more than enough information to move forward and get ideas and get inspired. 
yet another one, the Bay Area gar uh, Waterwise Gardening. Uh, another great site, and as you can see, they have a lot of resources. They also do something interesting. They are working with training local gardeners that do work on your land. Let's say you hire a gardener to, to take care of your landscape. You know, and right now we think of the mow blow guys that, that come, cut the lawn and leave. Well, having a sustainable waterwise garden requires a different approach to managing. You don't necessarily need them to come out every day or every month, week, but you need to plan and have them manage pruning or, or uh, cleaning up slightly differently than you would. And, and this organization trains gardeners to do that kind of work. So it's great. It's wonderful. The benefits of sustainable gardening, as I've been mentioning, many of the organizations want to encourage you to do that because it benefits their agenda. But for us, it creates a healthy, low maintenance landscape, not a no maintenance. You do need to do some maintenance, but it's certainly not every week you have to mow it or fertilize it or anything like that. You, you can lower your water bill by planting, um, creating an environment that is more sustainable. You can also limit the water quality degradation from runoff, meaning if water runs off from your yard or your driveway and you fertilized and that fertilizer or pesticide gets into our water system, um, that's not a good thing. So the more you can keep water on your property and the less you use pesticides and other chemicals, that improves our entire environment. If you practice sustainable gardening, you uh, reduce the amount of green waste removal. Uh, what that means is every time the truck comes and picks up your green waste, that truck is using energy. That truck is driving off somewhere. It has to then process your green waste. If you can find a way to reduce the amount of green waste you create, as well as possibly keeping it to make compost, then it's a, it, it, that again is a sustainable practice. You can extend the life of water resources and infrastructure. And this is why the water districts want this because if they have less dirty water or polluted water, then they can do a better job making good water for us or fresh, clean water. Another benefit is you, we enhance the habitat for all the critters that we have displaced by building our houses and, and uh, offices and everything like that. So, Having a, a more environmentally friendly and sustainable landscape, next thing you know, you've got birds and all sorts of other critters moving in. You can also lower your cooling and heating costs by how you place plants. Think about it if you have a large tree that shades the side of your house that gets the hot afternoon sun, that's going to have a significant cooling effect on your home. And also, you can improve air quality by another 10 cent word, carbon sequestration, if I said that right. So if we, if we drill down and look at what does that mean, fundamentally it means the plants absorb carbon dioxide from the air. They process this gas and break it apart, which brings the carbon into the soil and later ultimately releases oxygen into the air. It's a win-win all around. So if you plant a greater variety of plants that can can take care of that and, and oops i'm safe ups is safe. if you can process that then the air is better and we're all better off sorry about that so what are the components of sustainable landscaping um first of all know your climate you can't so a sustainable landscape is different from everybody's, uh, from different parts of the country or the world. And then you can, we need, another component is conserving water, preventing runoff, which we talked about a little bit, reducing green waste, reusing our hardscape, maintaining healthy soil, putting the right plant in the right place, and a diverse group of plants that create balance. So those are all the components that we're going to be going through. And, and as you've seen earlier, there's a lot of help 
and a lot of resources to give you more information about each one of these. So know your climate, and that's a map of Santa Clara County, and all the different uh, colors in this are the primary, what they call natural commu uh, communities. There's grassland, chaparral, uh, or woodland. So each one of those has its own unique environment. And of course, the gray is all our cement. Not, not really, but, but the environment ultimately depends on where you are. The kind of environment we have in Palo Alto is different than in, in Gilroy. Gilroy is hotter. And so the kinds of plants that would be successful there may or may not do well in Palo Alto. So keep in mind as you move forward to, to think of plants that are going to work specifically in your area. We are in a Mediterranean climate. Now what that means is that we have a dry summer and when we get rain, it's only in the winter. Uh, and you can see the average rainfall in Santa Clara County is about three and a half inches per month. But we get most of that rain in January and almost no month uh, rain in July, or as you can tell now in August. Now, as opposed to the photo on the right, there you have in New York, New York County, um, their driest month is February, but they still get three inches of rain in February, which is um, their dry month, and the average is over four inches a month. They have a different set of environmental issues or, or resources than what we have. And this, I think this chart is kind of interesting. If you look at overall the amount of water we have, fundamentally it's much smaller, but if you look May, June, July, August, September, we get almost no rain. And as, as you're seeing now, that also um, leads to issues in terms of, of fire and things like that. Whereas the average rainfall in New York County, and look at how much they get and what they can grow. They can grow all that nice green grass, but many of the plants that we can grow here will not do well in their environment at all. As I mentioned, one of the things about having no water or no rain in the, in the summer means that we have a very high probability of having fires, which we're experiencing right now. So these hot, dry summers bring on fires. There are fire safe landscaping practices that make a significant difference. So if you are in an area that does have um, exposure to fire, and I ultimately, all of us do, but certainly I'm in Mountain View, it's a little more urban. Uh, there are other parts of Santa Clara County that are definitely uh, more rural. Um, and so it is, if you think about it, it's, it's one of the key examples of sustainable landscaping. If you plant carefully to, to control how fire is going to react when it comes to your environment, and hopefully less, uh, that the fire would do less damage if you landscape properly. Uh, that is sustainable landscaping. It'll help you be live there more safely. And again, it's another example of living in balance with your environment. If your environment has fires, you want to create a situation where the fires won't do as well since you don't want them. But in researching for this talk, one thing that, that stood out to me, pruning, maintenance, and cleanup can have a greater impact on whether a plant ignites than does the type of plant it is. So planting a whole bunch of succulents isn't going to necessarily keep you safe from fires. It might be part of your entire uh, strategy, but managing the environment, taking care of any brush that's sitting around can have a greater impact on your safety. And one of the concepts is defensible space and as you can see in the diagram it's how you create and maintain a space that fire cannot get into your home into around your home these resources exist online i'm not going to go into them too much right now but keep in mind that there are ways you can plant keeping 
non-flammable materials, maybe using a different kind of mulch or paving closer to your home, making sure there's no extra wood or uh, sitting around, that can help. And also it says eliminating ladder fuels, meaning you don't want to create where a path for the fire to go, either to go along the ground or to go up a tree. So how you prune, how you plant, what you plant can make a huge difference. And there are excellent resources. Uh, the video that the Marin Master Gardeners put out on that is superb. Gives a very good approachable overview of what that means and what it looks like. And then of course, University of California has resources all about preparing your landscape for fires. Uh, there's also one called Safe Landscapes. California Garden Web, another uh, website that we mentioned earlier. And of course, Cal Fire, they want you to be ready for wildfires. If you do your part, they can do their part better for all of us. The next component of sustainable landscaping is a huge one and one that matters a lot to all of us. Because even though we've had other issues to, to have our intention right now, drought is a constant uh, part of our land of our environment. There's not enough water to meet all of our needs. So we need to conserve as much as we can. And some of the ways you do this is by optimizing what water you use through drip, drip irrigation. Uh, if you, you could also convert sprinklers that you have to rotary nozzles that are more efficient in terms of how they water. You can control when and how much you water with a smart controller. You can minimize your water loss with mulch, and you can choose plants that have low water needs. All of those things can help us conserve water. In terms of irrigation, uh, drip irrigation are tubes that have either little holes or little emitters, and they gradually drip water into the ground. Usually they're under mulch, and it's a very efficient way to get water into your soil. Uh, especially if you have mulch over that, it's, it's optimizing how the water is used. A rotary nozzle, as opposed to one that just sprays out, uh, as you can see in the photo, they, they have streams of water that are more efficient and that won't evaporate or get blown away as quickly as an as a overall spray. The smart controller, it can say when and how much water, so you can program it to uh, irrigate only in the morning uh, for five minutes and then rest and then five more minutes. And what that does is it lets the initial water soak into the ground and then rest a little so that more water when it comes won't run off. And another key thing to keep in mind, you want to make sure your, your irrigation is not running when it's raining out. So a smart controller can help you do that. Some of them actually uh, dial into weather services and know when it's supposed to rain and will pause and not water when they know it's raining. A good thing. The other thing, as, as we mentioned earlier, the San Jose Water District wants you to save water. And to do that, they are, often will give uh, rebates for different behaviors they want to encourage, whether it's replacing the rotaries, whether it's getting a, uh, a uh, irrigation controller, whether it's taking your lawn out and putting different plants. So look at your water district and see what, what kind of programs they offer. And, and, and it's a great way to save some money and they encourage you to, to have sustainable watering practices. A great way to save water and also improve your soil is mulching. And again, and again, and again. Mulching provides good weed control. In other words, when you have a layer of mulch on your dirt, it's more difficult for a weed to set, to a seed to set, to set and, and grow. It reduces the evaporation of water that is in your soil. It moderates the soil temperature, which means in the summer, it will keep the soil cooler. Uh, in the winter, it will keep soil warmer. And that means the roots in your plants are better protected. 
It reduces compaction and erosion from irrigation, rainfall, and foot traffic. Compaction, when the soil gets squished together, it, it can't, the roots can't get through as well as they could because the soil needs air. The roots need to be able to get through the soil and to be able to grow. And it keeps the soil more uniformly uh, moist as opposed to getting really dry and then getting wet, then getting ready to dry and wet between when you irrigate. Mulch. Now there's all kinds of different mulch, uh, as you can see in this nice photo that's a great grid uh, of everything from stones and pebbles and gravel to wood chips, different kinds of wood. Some wood chips are in little round bits. Uh, you can see here that middle picture is a pile of wood chips I had delivered in my driveway. Now you don't need that much and those were delivered free from a landscaping company that were cutting down trees and they grinder them up and they can either take them to the dump and dispose of them, which costs them, or they can put it on your driveway. You can contact them directly. I use a company called Chip Drop. They, they act as a middleman, but that is one way to get mulch. And on the right hand, picture you see how that's spread around my backyard. It decomposes over time. I've been doing that uh, for the last 20 years and now I don't need a pickaxe to get at my soil anymore. Another way to conserve water is gray water recycling and it is legal to install uh, but follow the guidelines that are set by the state. And as you can see in the diagram, you take water from your washing machine and it is distributed either to pipes or to a swale in your, in your landscape. The key though when doing this to, is remember that you're going to need to get special kind of washing soap that will not harm your plants. And on this Gray Water Action uh, website or all the information you need about the kind of, of uh, dishwashing soaps to get. Not dishes, laundry. Another way of saving water is harvesting rainwater. And it sounds like a great idea, which it is. The challenge we have is that all the rain comes in a very short time. So let's say you're we're having one of those big heavy rains of the, of the winter. It's coming down your drain pipes like crazy. You got gallons and gallons of it and you fill up your four bins and you use that, but then it's not gonna rain for another six months. So it's helpful, but it's, it's not for the, it can't create water for a year round unless you have a huge cistern that you're putting it in. But even, so it's one thing to keep in mind and it is definitely a possibility and resources exist to help you learn more about that. Okay. Another component of, of sustainable landscaping is preventing runoff. In other words, more that you can keep the water on your property, the better it is. So to do this, you can check that your irrigation is running well and that you're not watering the sidewalk, that you don't have a geyser. Use the cycle and soak feature we mentioned earlier that you water a little bit, let it soak in, give it some time, and then run the irrigation again or add more water. The way you can landscape to minimize rainwater runoff, you can create swales, and we'll, I'll show you a picture of that. You can mulch. The mulch does help keep the rainwater in your property. You can create a gravel trench near your driveway or walkway. So as the water is running off, it actually filters down through the gravel instead of running off into the sidewalk or into the to the street. And the other thing to keep in mind is when you're doing any kind of patio, walkway, or hardscape, create one that instead of cementing it flat, that has some way for the water to drain between the stones or the bricks so that the again the rainwater stays on your property instead of running down the driveway. And one of the things is you, if you can minimize or stop the use of any kind of chemical, 
then that means that residue will not run off into the storm drains. Another good thing. Uh, here's a swale. There's a variety of different ways to do that, but it fundamentally is a indented or shallower area where the rainwater uh, percolates through the stones and then drains better into the soil. But this way, with the stones, you don't have sitting water. It, it holds it for a while until it can drain into the soil. Another component of sustainable landscaping is reducing. Reducing the amount of green waste removal, as we mentioned earlier. Reduce the amount of stuff that goes out, out with, the, with the garbage removal. And if you can keep it local, that means the truck you know, isn't spending as much gas or energy to process your green waste. But do dispose of any diseased plant material. You don't want to keep that around. You want to make sure your environment is as healthy as possible. So that does go into either green waste or actually the trash if it's, if it's a, an invasive enough uh, problem. Design your garden in mind with the plant size in mind. So if you have a plant that doesn't get to be 20 feet, so you're not trying to cut it down all the time because it got too big, and there are, there are different plants that will get that big, uh, that means you're going to have less pruning. So if you have a space for a two foot plant, make sure that the plant you put in there will normally end up being around two feet. Uh, compost on, on your site, meaning save your prunings to compost. That way you're reducing the amount of waste that's sent off your property. And using mulch to prevent or reduce weeds and com compo conserve water. So that means you're not having enough weeds. When you don't have as many weeds, you don't have as much green waste, and everybody's happy. Reusing local source for hardscape. So this is a back patio I made from bricks that I got off of Craigslist. And anywhere you can get local instead of sending out to get that fancy uh, material that came from, that got shipped from Italy or Idaho, uh, if it can stay, if you can find things that you can use locally or reuse, it's better. Uh, there's one resource called Urbanite, and I love that because it's fundamentally broken concrete. Sometimes you can get the concrete sawed into uh, blocks, but it's definitely a great uh, to, uh, use material to use for building uh, walls, retaining walls, or possibly even making stepping stones out of it. But fundamentally, if you're going to make hardscape, as we mentioned earlier, have the water drain into the soil. So for instance, in between the bricks you see here and the paving uh, stones to the left, upper left, there is space where the water drains down. The water doesn't sit and pool or run off. And not just hard materials, you can also use wood from, from replaced fences. Or uh, in my backyard, you can see on the lower left, that was a fence that was, I salvaged some of the good pieces of wood, cut it up, and that's a fence I made around my air conditioner, so it doesn't look as ugly in air conditioning. Uh, on the right, I used some of the tall branches that I pruned from my neighbor's weed tree that just goes like crazy, and I used those as stakes for my cucumbers. So, um, and any of the yard waste I have, like when the cu cucumbers are finished, I put that into the compost. So we're reusing and, and building a, a cycle of, of using what we have and keeping it all local, which is fundamentally sustainability. So speaking of compost, compost is a wonderful thing. Uh, it enriches the soil just like mulch does, but even uh, with more nutrients. It can help retain moisture and suppress plant diseases and pests, uh, reduces the need for chemical fertilizer, certainly for any of your water-wise plants uh, and, and that kind of thing. For vegetables, you still might want some uh, supplemental 
organic fertilizer. It encourages the production of beneficial bacteria and fungi that break down organic matter. So it's a, it in itself is a cycle where the components that you put into your, comp your compost are eaten and, and somebody else eats them and then it all processes and it breaks down into good stuff that you can use on your yard. And it also reduces the methane emissions from landfills. So the more that you can keep on your property and keep it re, uh, composted so that you can then reuse it, every, it, it makes your soil better. And not to go into it too much, there's resources, but fundamentally composting is not that complicated. You take your green, brown stuff, which is any material, plant material that has actually died on the plant, uh, your greens, and that is plants that were green and alive when you pick them, uh, when you cut them, air and water. Those are the four components that go into making compost. And when you mix those all together, that then encourages the different micro, microbes that will take this all, chew it up, process it, and next thing you know, you have rich organic matter that can add great value to your soil. Uh, one of the things, if you chop your materials up smaller, they're going to break down more quickly. And if you turn them, that means they'll, they'll actually heat up and the process will happen faster. And also maintain an air and water balance. If it's totally dried out, uh, it does need moisture for some of the microbes to live. If it's too wet and all soupy, then there's not enough air for them to live either. So it's a big balance of all of that. And to learn more about that, uh, the Santa Clara County uh, has resources for that. There's actually a master composter program and there are a variety of different composting workshops, used to be live, I'm pretty sure they're probably doing things online. But again, Try it, not that complicated. You can have a fancy uh, box for composting, but you could set up just a pile in the corner and be just fine. Yet another component, and we've, we've moved into that, we've got the composting, which all goes part of the process of creating healthy soil. And the healthy soil is the foundation for creating a garden that's beautiful and, that, and having plants thrive. And the healthy soil ultimately is a self-balancing ecosystem, meaning you've got compost that provides nutrients for the, for the uh, microbes and other critters that live in the soil, which provides resources for the plants to grow. And it's a continuous cycle. The plant roots provide sugar and proteins that feed the soil organisms. These organisms die and they get eaten by worms and the worms get eaten by birds and birds leave more nutrients in the soil. So everything kind of cycles around and you end up, your soil ends up building more health and more, uh, a better environment for plants and the critters that live in them. And it's a whole soil full web. As soil food web. And as it says, a community of organisms living all of their parts or lives in the soil. But it's, it's, as you can see, a circle of the roots provide this, then the nematodes eat something, and then other, other critters eat something, and worms happen, and birds. So together, they work to nourish the soil and create a balanced environment. Now note out our soil here in Santa Clara County. One thing you should know, most of us have clay, which is not a bad thing. Remember that before there was Silicon Valley, there was actually a huge agricultural business because it's one of the richest environments for growing uh, in the world. And clay is good, it's just it needs organic matter to help it become more malleable so that, that plants can grow in it. So even though you might have start, like my yard 
when I first moved in, I needed a pickaxe to break up the soil. But over time and adding compost and mulch, the soil balanced out and is now, I can plant things quite easily in it. Again, it takes time, but you, but you start somewhere and it will pay back rewards in terms of the, the growth that you can have in your garden. So, been through a lot of information. So the 10 cent, this is some of the stuff we've gone through, looking at what exactly is sustainability. Um, we've talked about our climate in Santa Clara County, how it's a Mediterranean climate, and that climate guides us into ways of gardening that can, that need paying attention to the fact that we don't get any water in the summer, we get our rain in the winter. So those, that environment, that climate guides how we plant and what things we do to maintain, to be successful in our gardens. Fundamentally, we also talked about water. Use it, le use less or as little as possible, but use it wisely. We talked about reducing, reusing, and recycling. We've all heard that, but doing, doing it in a landscape environment also is part of a sustainable practice. And one of the foundations for doing that is mulching and composting, which adds the organic material that our soil needs. It can uh, save water, limit the, the loss of water, and also help to produce a better soil. So if you have that as a foundation, then you can start thinking about plants. And oh my goodness, are we lucky. There are so many things we can plant, such a variety. And from bulbs to uh, spiky things and, and perennials to tall trees to grasses, you, we have a plethora of, of choices and different types of shapes of plants that are acclimated to our climate. In addition, we can grow fruit trees. I have a lot of fruit trees. And if you think about it, I have fruit trees combined with low water plants. So I take my water budget and have less water for plant, for ornamentals, and I use more water for my fruit trees. And it's a balance, uh, and I enjoy doing that. And we're, again, we're lucky we can grow all kinds of fruit trees, but we also have a palette of uh, plants that are adapted to our climate. There are plants that are native to California, but there are also plants that are in, from similar climates, like Australia or South Africa or Chile, that are also adapted to our, to our area. And so, where do you start? And how do you be successful? The fundamental thing to keep in mind for being successful with different plants is planting the right plant in the right place. And how do you do that? How do we decide which plants will grow in our garden in this nice place, soil that we've developed? Keep in mind the plants that are adapted to our climate of wet winters and uh, drought in the summer, that they fit in zones uh, 14 to 17, the sunset zones or USDA zone nine. That means the temperature range that they do well in. So some plants will die if they get too much cold weather or if, if it frosts. Some parts of Santa Clara County will get some hard freezes. Some get very little frost at all. So Keep that in mind when you are choosing which plants to, to bring into your garden. And you also need to evaluate the locations in your garden. So in any individual property, there are parts that get full sun, part shade or shade. Uh, some of my yard gets sun, but it gets uh, softer uh, sun that, that kind of fades in the afternoon, the back end gets the hot, hot south facing uh, afternoon sun. So plants have to be pretty hardy to make it back there. Keep in mind and watch the sun movement throughout the day, but also throughout the year. So depending on where 
the sun is in the year, maybe one of your neighbor's trees shades out apart uh, during, during the, the winter, but in the summer, that particular part is in full, full sun. So getting back to right plant, right place, read the label. You know, do your research online, but also keep in mind that there are many different varieties of an individual plant. So you might say, I want to see an Othis. Well, there are ground hu hugging C. Othis, and there are C. Othis that get to be 15 feet. So reading the label makes you aware of, well, I, what, what's going to happen with this particular variety of, of plant. Now, same thing with grasses. You see a nice display of ornamental grasses at the nursery, and they all look very, very cute. And you say, okay, I like this one. Well, some of the grasses can do well in little water, but some actually do need a lot more water because their native habitat, even in California, is in a, let's say they're near a stream. So they're going to be used to having more water. And again, watch how big that plant grows uh, and make sure that it has display, the place to grow. And the labels usually do say how much water it needs. You might see low water, uh, moderate water, or some even say need to be continually wet. So that can give you a clue as to if it's going to be appropriate in your yard or not. The best time to plant is late fall to early winter, and that's October to February. I have tried planting in other times. It is very tempting in the springtime. We're geared towards putting out all our spring plants because that's been the cycle that, that we've been led to leave is normal, but for us it's not. Keep in mind, any plant you're gonna plant, say in May, has to be able to survive a very hot, dry summer, which means that you are going to be watering it quite frequently and it may or may not be able to handle that stress. Whereas if you plant it in, in the fall, it has the winter and the moist to establish roots and to get, uh, get settled in place before a heavy summer. Now, even that first year, if it's had the nice winter to get established, you're still gonna need to water the younger plants a little more frequently until they get established. And the time frame for, for a lot of the water wise plants, it, there's a, a, a phrase that, that, keeps, that helps explain it. They sleep the first year, they creep the second year, and the third year they leap, which means you're gonna put your plant in the ground and it's gonna sit there. And you're thinking, well, that's not doing anything. Well, the plant is actually spending most of its time getting situated in its new place, developing roots, and uh, getting comfortable. The next year, creep. So it's starting to get a little bit bigger and, and getting a settled even more and getting better established. And next thing you know, you turn around the third year and all of a sudden this plant has gone from being this little thing to a, a nice, big, healthy plant. Avoid the tendency to get a bigger plant because you want a bigger plant. Smaller plants, let's say one gallon, possibly at the most a five gallon, are more likely to get better established because they have more time to get comfortable in the native soil as opposed to being babied and in, in a nursery environment. So it's tempting to want to get a big plant, but remember we're working within nature's time frame, which is a little bit longer than instant gratification. Diverse plants create a balance. So when you plant, instead of having a flat monoculture in like a lawn where everything's the same, when you have a variety of different plants, they balance each other out. They'll have uh, pests, pests on one plant will get eaten by beneficial insects that come in from another. So it creates a whole balance. And we have a huge range of plants to choose from. And we can create environments, everything from a very formal, uh, organized, rectilinear kind of design where things are repetitive and, and balanced and beautiful, 
another kind of beauty is a more casual where you have a blend of uh, plants that come and go to, to different sizes and different shapes. There's no right or wrong. You have the choice to do all kinds of things. Um, and you can also have areas for growing fruits and vegetables. That's not bad. It's just, again, think in terms of your water budget, how much water you, over, you use overall. Put those together so that you're optimizing plants that need more water together. And keep in mind, you can design your garden to be, maybe you want a place for contemplation. Maybe you want a place to entertain or maybe a place for, for children to play. It's, it's all possible. We have the palette of plants that can, can have you do that. It just takes a little research and understanding them. All of this diversity also creates a balance, uh, an environment for wildlife. So you, you attract a variety of different insects. We've got a lot of different bees besides just the honeybees, which aren't native. There are uh, birds, bees, butterflies, and I've seen this in my own yard. On the, on the lower left, that photo is actually a bee that fell asleep. I found that bee in the morning, he was sleeping on the flower, and later when the sun hit it, it, it woke up, or her, woke up and flew away. Uh, on the upper right, you see there's a fountain in my backyard. Every morning, usually around 6, 6.30, there are hummingbirds that come and take a bath in that fountain. And it's wonderful to see them splashing and then they fly off to a little tree branch and dry themselves off and fight and come again. So there's a lot of joy in your garden that goes beyond just the plants and, and knowing you've created a, an environment that's, that's sustainable and good for everybody. And just like all the other resources, there are lists of plants uh, that can help you be educated and enlightened. Uh, the UC Davis Arboretum has a list of plants called the Arboretum All-Stars. These are plants that they have tested and tried in all sorts of environments throughout California, and they recommend them as to be good for uh, good low water plants. They also have worked with different growers that create the, uh, grow the plants that are then available in your nursery. So some plants you'll see and you want to get this fancy plant, but you can't find it. Um, the UC Davis did a great job of filling out that whole cycle. So not only can you research the plant and see how well it performs, but you can also find it in your nursery. And if it doesn't exist, if you don't see it in your nursery, ask them. Often they can order it or it might be out of stock, that kind of thing. So do ask so that they know that people do want to buy these kinds of plants. There's another thing that you might see, the water use classification of landscape species, or calls. Some of the uh, places that do rebates will say, well, you need to use plants that have certain kind of calls classifications. So it's another resource to understand how much water certain plants use. Another great resource is from the California Na Native Plant Society. California native plants are great. Uh, some of them thrive in our gardens. Some are a little bit more difficult. So if you want an all native plant garden, that's fine. But there's nothing wrong with getting plants from Australia that are acclimated or, or suitable for our climate as well. It's whatever, whatever you, you want. Uh, both, you can do both. And again, this website, Calscape, has a lot of information about those plants. And the Santa Clara County Sustainable Gardening Plant Guide. A, again, a great resource. Santa Clara County wants you to create a sustainable landscape, create a landscape that fits within our environment and uh, helps you be successful with using less water. Wow. So that's a lot of information. And as I mentioned in the beginning, there, is, there are all kinds of resources to help you learn more. But where do you start? Kind of, I don't know about you, but your head gets spinning, my head gets spinning when I think about all of this. It seems like so much. But really, take some time to look at where your garden is right now. Uh, 
Does it work? Are there things that don't work? Are there ways to save water? Could you upgrade your irrigation? Could you add irrigation? Could you convert to drip? Uh, those are all possibilities. Um, could you improve your soil by adding compost or mulch? Smaller steps, one step at a time, helps you get to know your garden better and also helps you start building a more sustainable garden. So making a compost pile, for instance, the next time you prune things. Also, another thing to do is take a walk. See what your neighbors are doing. Get, an, get a feeling for things that you like. Do you like a look uh, down the street that they did this and it seems to, it seems to fit into things that you find attractive? Uh, are there plants that you particularly like? Is there a landscape? Is there an approach to a home that's similar to yours that you think would be inviting for your home? Is there uh, a, a way that somebody has planted things that you think hmm, that would work for me? So photograph them. Uh, talk, to the, talk to the homeowners and see, did they have somebody do it? Did they do it themselves? How did they do it? And of course, a lot of online resources exist to help you be successful and to help you learn more. And also just give it time. Uh, nature works on its own calendar. I know sometimes we want to have it right away, but it's an ongoing project and it can be a lot of fun, especially now that we have a little more time to spend in our garden and get to know and it will help you uh, grow it and yourself. So. As I mentioned before, lots and lots of resources. They are in the handout that's been uploaded in the chat area uh, and Master Gardener website. And you can do obviously searches on this. If, if you do a, a search on sustainable gardening in California or UC sustainable gardening, many of these websites will come up. Uh, the UC Davis sustainable gardening, California Garden Web, Santa Clara County Sustainable, San Jose Sustainable, East Bay Water District, um, Bay Area Gardening, Gray Water Use, Santa Clara County Composting. So make sure you, when you're doing searches, that the organizations you're, you're going, th going to are either University of California, because all of this information you're getting from the University of California is based on research. They're not just making it up or trying to sell you plants or anything like that. They want you to be successful in a, in a sustainable way and they, they know what they're talking about. In fact, Master Gardeners exist as part of the University of California uh, system to help you be successful. So do uh, email or contact us and here you are taking, coming to this talk. Um, so all of these resources are part of your sustainable toolkit, if you will, to help you be successful. So in conclusion, advice to grow by, ask us. That's what we're here for. That's why we're here today.